okay guys so hello everyone our goal with flying stories is to introduce pilots and their <clears throat> ideas to help you actually execute on your flying dreams today's guest is a ridiculously successful pilot from manali he started flying at age 14 and has been romancing in the sky since past 26 years while there was absolutely no one at that time in the country to give structured training he went through the progression of learning paragliding through magazines paragliding videos and talking to other pilots he is the first indian pilot to fly acro competitions in india and till date the only pilot to have represented india in fai world aerobatics he has been the he has been one of the most successful xc competition pilots in the country and the only pilot to have reached the fai ranking in of top 50 in the world he was the first pilot along with andy to fly from billing to manali which was considered impossible once he is the one who actually gifted flying in beer back mountains to the world and in a way every other pilot coming to be should thank this guy because he has made their dreams come true it was once considered impossible in his personal life debu is married uh, with two kids all with with flo mathias and manu he now stays in france and earns his living as paragliding xc guide siv instructor and flying tandems due to family commitments he reduced his engagement momentarily in competition flying but being a true adventurer and co- and competitor that he is in the most simplest form of free flying he started showing his class by chasing distance records in the country he is one of he is one of the first ones to fly 200 kilometers out and return flights from billing and thereby introducing again to the world that beer billing is a place to visit for all who dream exceeds pilots from around the world chase his distance records his lines every year only to get disheartened by new distance record that he creates when he comes next needless needless to say his tracks his track logs are most analyzed by xc pilots coming coming to beer every time in my pursuit to understand and learn the greatest paragliding pilots in the country he is one of he is the one that sets the standard for us so please help me welcoming the man who currently holds the record of flying the longest distance in himalayas and only indian to have flown 300 kilometers plus flight an acro pilot a world class xc pilot a world class competition pilot professional tandem pilot xc guiding instructor siv instructor and in my eyes one of the most complete pilots of our generation the sarvagun sampan debu choudhary <laughs> debu go ahead yeah, all yours thanks thanks alok wow what a what a intro huh eh? you prepare i think you've been preparing that since yesterday <laughs> no no I'm, i, I uh, prepared in the morning yes <laughs> i'm very flattered uh, by your intro and uh, yeah it's uh, it's an uh, it's an honor to be part of uh, the indian uh, paragliding community and uh, i'm glad that uh, that i can uh, share and and uh, help others achieve uh, what is what is the dream of of paragliding and uh, and help learn um i would like to thank uh, badri for uh, this initiative of this uh, this zoom meetings uh, i first logged in yesterday and uh, had a look and saw how it worked and i think it's uh, it's a really good idea especially in this uh, these strange times that we're all uh, at at the moment you know where we're all stuck at home and everyone is uh, has got a lot of time so uh, i think badri that's a really good initiative same as with your flying stories it's it's really nice you know to to share uh, to share the knowledge and uh, and experiences with with all the other pilots and and help uh, bring bring more knowledge uh yesterday after i I w- I took part a little bit in Sunit's discussion just to see how it worked. Uh yesterday evening I listened to Gulpreet's interview which I thought was really good as well and uh, a really nice uh, way to share. And um so I think what's really good about this as well is uh, like each of us is doing uh, sessions like this and 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 sharing sharing info and I think it's really good that uh there'll be different different people sharing maybe similar things but each each person has his own way of of uh, sharing things and uh, each way, person has his own way of teaching so i think it's uh, it's great that uh, we can all uh, do this together over the next few weeks till hopefully we'll be let out and uh, each person gives his uh, different input and a different way of uh, 
of uh, sharing the info and uh, the knowledge that we have gained over the years. Um, so I'm going to start. Let me get uh, to uh, to today's topic, which Badri uh, and me discussed yesterday, and he suggested me this topic, which is basics of thermaling and cross country. Uh, it's a huge topic. Okay, it could go on for a long, long time. Um, so I've prepared a little bit for it, not hugely. I'm not very good at preparation, uh, but I think uh, so. What for me also, what's really good about this system uh, with this Zoom app is uh, the interactivity. Also, I really like, especially when I teach, I really like interactivity and questions and answers and everyone to be part of a group rather than just someone giving a lecture. So same as what Gurpreet said yesterday, this is not a class. It's not a, it's not a lesson. It's more of a discussion, which he, he put very well yesterday. Uh, it's more of a discussion. So I will do a few topics and then uh, we can start with the questions and answers, which is the part that uh, I find uh, will be more interesting. Uh, so the topic uh, thermaling and XC kind of go hand in hand. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little bit about thermaling basics and then we can talk about cross country basics. I am not going to go into the theory about why thermals are formed, how they work and all of that because there is so much info online and maybe in future sessions there's people who are more knowledgeable than me about those kind of things and they can explain. What I am going to talk about is my experience and how I, what techniques I use uh, for these, uh, for thermaling uh, and cross country, etc. And then uh, you can ask questions and we can discuss different uh, topics of, uh, of, of these uh, different, uh, uh, different aspects of these topics, yeah? So uh, let's start uh, a little bit with thermaling. Um, everyone uh, at some point or the other in their paragliding career, you know, they start, it's, thermaling is basically rising air, which we use to keep us in the air, okay? Uh, so everyone at some point or the other is going to be looking at thermaling. They will start with their basic flights, top to bottoms, whatever. The idea, of course, everyone wants to stay in the air as long as possible, fly as far as possible, etc., etc., etc. So thermaling. Uh, let's start with uh, basically what is a thermal? A thermal is a mass of air, a column, whatever, going up, which we use to gain height. Okay, uh, gaining height permits us to stay in the air for a longer time, and gaining and height is our fuel. We don't have an engine with a paraglider. A paraglider is a glider. So once we have some height, we can use that height to glide from A to B, which is the next place. Um, so let's start with uh, sources. Where do we look for thermals or what creates thermals? Okay, we know that thermals are created by heat. It's hot air which is going up. So obviously we need the sun for a thermic day. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, places where the sun is heating more than others or faces depending on the time of the day. Is it morning? Is it an east face? Is it afternoon, a west face? Um, like I said, I'm not going to go into all of this. Uh, let's, um, let's start with just saying, let's start about basic thermaling techniques and the actual piloting skills that are needed uh, to, to start thermaling. Uh, so the first thing is when we have a thermal, obviously there is a mass of air that's going up and the air around it is going down. And obviously a thermal is going to create some turbulence. So the first skill a pilot kind of needs once we start thermaling is to have some control of his glider and be able to, um, to actively fly his glider and keep it open. Okay. So for that, uh, you're going to have to start flying in more and more active air, uh, but also it's very important for pilots to not fly in act air that's too active for them and get scared because as we know with flying, uh, fear is a big part of flying and uh, if we get scared, then it, it holds us back. So I would say uh, for new pilots, uh, you should start very progressively flying in conditions that are stronger and more thermic. And as soon as it 
it gets a little bit too much for you or it starts getting stronger, then maybe fly away from the area or, uh, or go down and, and fly another day. Um, one second, look at some notes. Okay, so uh, we talked uh, about active flying and how important that is for thermaling. Um, next, let's uh, let's see. Uh, a lot of pilots have a conception uh, that a thermal is a straight column of air that's going up, and once we get inside, we start circling, uh, going round and round, and we will go up. In a very basic form, that's kind of true, but uh, a, th a thermal is a mass of air that's moving, and there's a lot of factors that uh, that depend on how that mass of air is moving. One of those factors is wind. Uh, usually there is always some wind, if it's either it's a meteor wind or it's um, uh, thermic winds which are created with the masses of air flowing up a slope. Uh, and wind will obviously move a thermal and create some drift with the thermal. So a very important part of uh, actually, it's once you're in a thermal, it's not just going round and round. You are trying to first figure out the drift of the thermal or which way the wind is coming from. And then usually what's happening is we are doing more oval shaped turns, whereas our leg into the wind is always going to be longer than the down leg, uh, the downwind leg. Uh, so it's not actually just circles, you are doing more oval shapes. And the idea is also always to be looking for the strongest part of the lift. Uh, and you don't want to be because at the edges of the thermal we have turbulence uh, and the, weak, uh, the lift is stronger in the center of the thermal and it gets weaker as we go towards the outside. So you want to be in the central part of the thermal circling. So you're going to have to adapt your circles uh, according to the drift or the amount of wind or moving yourself around looking for that stronger part of the lift rather than just start circling and keep that circle. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense to most people. Uh, it's very, that's a very important part of it is uh, what I find as well is a lot of beginner people when they start thermaling, uh, just once they hit some lift, they're like, okay, it's a thermal and they start just circling round and round. Uh, I think it's super important to move yourself around and try and find the stronger lift. So it's not a nice circle. It's more of an oval and sometimes even a square or just moving around and trying to find uh, find that uh, center of the thermal. And once you hit the stronger lift, that's when you can start turning more sharply and more aggressively to stay in that core. Because as we know, when we turn a paraglider, we increase the sink rate, okay? So if you are turning very sharply in weak lift, it, it, it doesn't translate as you going up. You will end up uh, either going down or not gaining much height. So the stronger, obviously, the stronger the lift, the tighter you want to make your turn to stay in that strong lift. And the weaker the lift, the more you're going to open up those turns and stay more flat so that uh, uh, you... you think more than you're actually rising up. Yeah. Sh should we start with a few questions? Give me a little break, Alok, what do you think? Yeah, I think it should be okay. Uh, let me allow everyone, they can mute themselves, uh, unmute themselves. Uh, anyone who has a question can unmute and uh, raise a question right now. Okay, looks like we don't have uh, any questions. Okay, oh, we'll move topic. But... <laughs> okay. What's the new look? Hello. Huh? Uh, Rebu, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay listen. Uh, let's, uh, let's just talk about the technique you use during thermal, you know. Uh, instead of just saying uh, why it's coming, where it's coming from, because I think the people are following it, uh, they all know what Hubble is, and it's all in the, just it's better if you explain your technique, how you use your technique uh, 
in different conditions in the same in the thermal, but the thermal in the different areas, even in least side thermal or whatever. If you can explain that, would be better. Okay. Was well, can you can you repeat that? I can't I can't hear properly. It's not very clear. Okay. I, I was I was just uh, telling because uh, instead of going to, uh, for a uh, theory like well, why thermal is coming and where is coming, I think uh, it's it's, uh, it's not uh, it's easy because uh, people they know through internet or whatever by book. Uh, it's it's important if you explain the technique you use during different conditions and the thermal different behavior and then yeah, yeah how you how you adapt it. Okay. Okay, I heard that. I to see you, Ajay. By the way, you, your, your, our beard is almost the same. Huh? We have the same look. Huh? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I think what I, I think uh, that's a, that's a, that's a good suggestion, Ajay. That's a good question to actually maybe say uh, how I thermal and uh, depending on the conditions and what, um, uh, rather than uh, go through the thermaling. Uh, okay, so uh, like I said, it really depends on the strength of, uh, for me, when, uh, if I'm looking for lift, it really depends on the strength of the thermal. If I find a strong thermal that's going up fast, let's say more than three meters a second, I am going to be much more aggressive and try and get inside the core and turn as tightly as I can uh, and really stay with that core. So if it's, yeah, if it's a strong thermal, I will be much more aggressive. Also remember that if it's a strong thermal, uh, you know, the air is, uh, there's big air around. If you have thermals that are four, five, six meters a second, it's going to be more turbulent. Uh, and that's going to demand that you are much more in control and in authority with your glider. So I will be much more aggressive. I will try and find the core and turn as tight as possible. On a really strong thermal, you can find yourself uh, going round and round, almost like in a spiral, but obviously going up. Uh, now, to the opposite of that, if conditions are really weak, uh, I'm not going to be flying around being aggressive and doing really tight turns because I will just end up going down and missing the thermal, obviously. Uh, or even if I'm in the thermal, my sink rate will be more. So obviously, when a, a thermal is really weak, or the lift we are minimizing our sink rate so flying with a bit more as flat as possible and minimum brake side circles trying to find, maximize the lift so uh, that would be uh, that would be uh, the te the main thing i would i would say is uh, yeah uh, as soon as it starts getting strong you need to be in command and you need to be a little bit more aggressive so that you don't get pushed around because what happens is when the conditions are strong and thermals are strong a thermal might try and push you out. And if you're being very uh, timid with it and, oh, I'm scared to turn, you're just gonna get banged around. So um, there's a saying that an uh, uh, old friend of mine, Sumit, came up with years ago. He, was, uh, he said, uh, uh, you thermal the thermal, don't let the thermal thermal you. Yeah? So which means don't, don't get kicked around by the thermal. As soon as it gets strong, you need to be aggressive. And in that thermal and uh, using uh, the speed of your glider uh, to, to keep and to keep the pressure in the glider uh, and to try and stay in the core. Um, another thing is sometimes I know, uh, you know, for me, uh, I can say that we, we have, you know, for ex us experienced pilots, it's uh, easier to say, oh, I've been controlled and I can be aggressive. Uh, whereas someone who has less experience, it can be maybe quite a scary experience. Um, Again, it really depends on the situation you're in. If you're in a strong thermal and it's a bit too much for you and you have an option to run away or find smoother air, then great. Uh, if you don't feel like it, obviously don't do it. You can move from that place. But if you're, say, on a cross-country flight and uh, you have to take that climb to make the next crossing or whatever, also try and remember that the more efficient you are in the thermal, uh, the more quickly you get it over with, uh, the quicker you can get yourself out of there. 
So if you have to take a climb, don't stay in the same place, getting kicked around, getting more and more scared. Uh, uh, and be a bit more aggressive take that climb get up and go and find another internet connection is unstable alok go ahead uh, debu uh, in between yes is going uh, it's coming and going but it's more or less still audible and uh, usable for us Devu, can you hear us? Uh, okay, uh, I keep, uh, I keep, I can hear you just about. Yeah, it seems to be cutting off, but it seems to be coming back. Yeah, yeah. In between, it's coming and going. Um, maybe, uh, Elvin, can you switch off videos if uh, possible, and we see whether bandwidth improves. I don't know. I'm just making a guess. What has been suggested earlier? Uh, okay. Yeah, there are more than sixty. Going on. Yeah, there are more than sixty participants. So yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's uh, let me carry. Yeah, it's better now. It's better now. Okay, yeah. maybe yeah, that's helping as well as people. It's not as funny though. You can't see everyone. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, so let, let, let me talk another thing about, uh, about thermaling uh, that I think it's important that people, especially pilots who are looking to get into cross country uh, and, you know, like Ajay said, what's your techniques and stuff. Um, I think uh, it's very important in your early days in the career before you actually start going cross country and stuff is to really practice thermaling and try and understand uh, understand uh, more and more about it. I mean, uh, like Ajay said, these days there is a lot of videos and books and stuff to help you actually understand what a thermal is and different techniques people use and different explanations of how to climb. But um, what I think is important as well is, is, is later to progress to become a good cross-country pilot is that Thermaling should become almost like second nature to you. Okay, so you need to really practice it, and it should become uh, it should come naturally. That once you are, you know, like a really good pilot, once you are, you have found that climb, and you have started climbing in it and used it. It your uh, body language uh, and your inputs should become more and more natural, so that you are using less and less of your brain power for actually trying to center the thermal or keeping your glider open uh, and all of that. And you can actually use that brain power uh, to plan your next move on your flight. You know, look at the next transition, look at where the next thermal trigger is gonna come from. So what I'm trying to say with this is, uh, thermaling should become uh, instinctive. It should become second nature, which for me, it kind of is, you know, once, uh, and I'm sure some of the uh, more experienced and good pilots will agree. Once you enter in a thermal uh, and you, okay, the first few moments are quite critical when you want to actually catch it and get the core. But once you are settled into a core and you're going round, uh, all those little adjustments of, like I said before, the, you know, making more oval circles or moving yourself around uh, to find the center of that lift, it all should become, uh, it should become instinctive and natural. You shouldn't have to be thinking too much about that. I know in the beginning, it's not easy. That's why it's very important to practice thermaling. So, uh, you know, I mean, let's say sometimes uh, if we go people, I mean, you know, cross country is uh, obviously the aim for a lot of pilots. Uh, but what can happen is maybe you go flying on a day, say in beer or Panchkani or wherever. And you see it's not it's uh it's not going to be a perfect cross country day i'm not going to fly uh yeah. 20 30 40k whatever whatever your uh whatever your uh, aim is i think you've got some new participants with uh, not muted a look but anyway i can hear unmute everybody
thermaling and sometimes it's not easy to do and sometimes when conditions are not great and maybe thermals are not great people tend to be like oh it's it's not a great day i'm gonna go and land uh which sometimes is fine but uh maybe it's not a great day to go cross country but there's thermals around and you could still fly around for three or four hours and practice your thermaling to try and get to that state where thermaling becomes second nature i mean i know when i learned uh, when we started thermaling and flying we were all very young we were all super enthusiastic and uh we learned very slowly and we didn't actually go cross country for a long time or go very far. We were just happy to be able to stay up uh, with the gliders we had basically. You know, if we could stay in the sky for a few hours, that was, uh, that was more than enough uh, to keep us happy. So I think that's very important that uh, you actually practice thermaling and keep, you know, keep trying to get more and more experience in the thermals, which will make it much easier when the thermals get stronger or uh, when uh, when conditions get a bit rough if you're used to flying even when it's not perfect conditions that will help you a lot as a pilot can we have some more questions maybe something hello sorry guys if anyone has questions yeah you can go ahead badri yes go ahead yeah, uh, Debu, uh, since not many questions coming up, so I would like to ask one or two. Um, when there are no reference of flying object for you to find the next thermal, how do you find a thermal by all alone? <coughs> um, so that's a good question, Badri. Uh, if there's no reference, I mean, uh, there is usually there is always some kind of reference but if there is no reference uh depends where i'm flying if i'm flying in mountains or in flats uh i'm much more of a mountain pilot so in mountains uh when i am gliding for the next thermal uh usually i will look at the terrain uh and try and figure out uh, how the terrain is formed uh where the wind should be coming from where is a good trigger point uh, what time of the day it is and which faces are exposed to most heat and sunlight. And by putting all of those points together, uh, I will make an assumption that, okay, this looks like a good spot uh, for a thermal trigger or where the next climb should be, and I will head for there. Um, now, another good point to with that is uh, usually uh, I'm talking about mountain flying. Yeah? I'll talk about uh, flatlands in a second. Uh, what I also do is I always try and figure out at least two or even three uh, trigger options and lower down on a ridge or whatever. So say, let's call them A, B, C. Uh, my ideal thermal trigger would be A, uh, because I've seen that there is a gully running up and there is a nice spur with a nice trigger and it's in the sun and it looks good. But as a, okay, once I've figured that, okay, that's where I want to get to, I check, okay, I can glide to there. I have enough height to make it there, I think, unless I have unseen sink or whatever. Uh, I will also pick a point lower down, a second trigger, which I will say, okay, if A doesn't work, I can easily glide from A to point B to look for a second thermal and the same to point C and eventually to a safe landing area if you're going cross country. Yeah? So this would be how it works in the mountains for me. I will read the terrain, uh, try and uh, visualize where the lift is coming from and all of the, put all of those things together. And uh, the better pilot you are, the better you get at guessing where is the climb. Yeah? Uh, obviously, when I'm flying in beer or somewhere like that, uh, I've been flying there so long, I know pretty much the whole ridge. Uh, but uh, when it's somewhere new, you put all of that knowledge in and try and figure it out. Uh, now, in flatlands, it's a whole different game. Uh, and I'm, I've only started doing more flatland flying in the last couple of years, and I find it very interesting. Uh, in flatlands, if you're looking for a climb and there's no signs, I mean, in flatlands, you're obviously looking for clouds, which is going to help you... Um, find the next climb. If there's no clouds, you're looking at different contrasts in the terrain or something that could trigger a thermal, uh, uh, you know, that could trigger a thermal from the ground, uh, edge of a lake or uh, some small hill or anything. Uh, and in flatlands, I've found that if 
you're not finding much, then uh, the best uh, option is just to run downwind. Uh, if you're getting low and you're not finding much, uh, I found uh, running downwind and hoping and praying that you'll get something soon, you know. Um, does that answer your question, Padri? Yeah, yeah, that's clear for me. So I'll ask one more question in case there is no, nobody else is asking. Yeah. K K has a question. Let Badri finish. I'll ask after that. No, no, I'm just asking because there was not much interaction. So please go ahead. Badri is filling. Debu, uh, I mean, I'll take the example of beard. Sometimes, like, uh, we are in these real strong thermals. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, we like really rocketing up. And within that, there is that one punch that comes in and wants to just like toss you around. So uh, uh, maybe a even mm -hmm. more stronger core or just a punch. So uh, how would you go about uh, taking that lift? Because you know, it's sometimes it's really knocking you out, but you still want to get better. How do yeah. you do that? Um, like I said before, yeah, you know, the more the more aggressive the conditions, the more aggressive you need to be. Yeah. Now, what is aggressive? So, what is aggressive is uh, aggressive is turning tight, being fully in control with your glider and not being scared to give big brake inputs to uh, to send your glider where you want it to. Now, obviously, uh, that does take a lot of experience and you need to be very comfortable with being able to throw your glider around and have extremely good glider control. So, I mean, and all of those things comes with uh, practice and experience, you know, the more you're used to uh, having, well, I mean, Acro helped me a lot uh, to, to become a better pilot. And I would re recommend to everyone to at least have some basic Acro wing overs and spiral dives and all of those things should be in your box of tools if you want to be a good cross country pilot. Because obviously, if you're used to having your wing at strange angles, not always nice and perfectly sitting above your head. Uh, and if you're comfortable with throwing your wing around, then obviously when it's like you're saying, when it's really strong or you're getting that punch, uh, rather than being scared of it, you are actually confident enough to say, okay, I can turn my glider, you know, I can almost uh, spin my glider if I need to and get it back under control to actually stay in that strong part of the lift. So that, yeah, it comes down to glider control and tolerance to, to strong air, which obviously comes with experience and, uh, right. and flying more and more. Yeah, does that answer your question, but, uh, KK? Thank you. Yeah. Gurpreet has a question. Gurpreet, go ahead. Uh, hi, Debo. Nice hi, Gurpreet. I would like to hear your views on weak conditions, particularly weak and windy conditions. Okay. Um, in a, in a general context or flatlands or or what could be? Ah, uh, general and flatlands particularly also. Okay. Um, so uh, this uh, that's also a good point. It's kind of the opposite of uh, of KK's question. Uh, what do you do when it starts getting weaker and windier? Uh, so I think the first thing, uh, which is not always easy for me, uh, and maybe for a lot of pilots, especially uh, pilots who are used to flying in mountains and in strong conditions, is, uh, is patience. I mean, uh, developing patience. Uh, and that, uh, I'm getting better and better at it. It takes a long time, but as soon as it starts getting weak and windy and broken, uh, you need to be really patient, I think, and work each little each little small bit of lift, even if it seems insignificant, like uh, sometimes we've had, uh, you know, in competitions, uh, Gurpreet will know well, you know, we've been maybe stuck, uh, stuck at a place where it's weak and you're hardly staying up or you're slowly going down. And it's very easy to, to give up when it's uh, weak and windy and say, oh, this is, this is not going to work. Uh, I will go down. But uh, if you're patient, then uh, it's surprising how... Sometimes even, you know, even after hanging around in a place for 20 minutes, you can, uh, you can, you know, by the time it takes for a smaller cycle, a slightly bigger cycle, a slightly stronger cycle to get going and take you through, um, 
it can uh, it can work. So I would say the main thing is patience, and then the second thing, obviously, is uh, really trying to move around with those small pieces of lift. And like, uh, if it's windy, then being aware of how much wind there is and looking at at your drift, and you know, maybe using using that wind to get yourself into a position where there might be a better trigger. So. Um, yeah, I would say a lot of patience and uh, trying to read read the terrain and the climbs more, uh, and yeah, slowly moving yourself to to a better place where it might be better. Uh, with flatlands as well, it can be. Uh, I mean, I was last year when I was in Brazil, we had a couple of uh, things when you got stuck low and uh, it's really weak, uh, and again, patience paid off. I mean, I was with a group of pilots and three of us stuck with it, stuck with it for half an hour. Uh, the fourth and fifth pilot had enough and went and landed. And uh, we eventually got up and went on to fly another 100, 120 K. So, yeah, I think patience is, is the main thing in that. Does that answer your question, Burpreet? Kind of? Yeah. Would you like to add anything on like uh, actual handling of thermal inside the very thermal? Anything you do like more um, weights, less weight? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I can elaborate a little bit on that. I mean, uh, if it's a weak thermal, like I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, you you want to be like uh, so. Like I said, in to KK, you you know, the stronger the climb is, the stronger, more rougher, the more aggressive you need to be. Uh, I would say when it's really weak, uh, it's the opposite. You need to be as less aggressive as possible and as gentle as possible. So all you know, all your turns need to try and be as smooth as possible. You're using a lot of weight shift. You want to slow the glider down. You want to bring it to minimum sink, obviously. Uh, and making those turns as flat as possible. So, so using as much of the lift as possible and being as gentle as possible. I mean, when it's weak, if you start throwing your glider around, obviously you're going to increase your sink rate. Uh, so yeah, just being very gentle, making smooth turns. I mean, with the, with the comp gliders or the two liner gliders we have, uh, I've even often, when it's really weak, I, uh, I might have, uh, just some brake on the inside and even using the B toggle just on the outside without the brakes of the glider, the outside is flying without any drag, you know, it's flying as smooth as possible and you're just using the outside bees to, uh, to keep the glider in control and going round. So yeah, I would say uh, be as gentle and smooth as possible when it's weak and uh, as aggressive as you can when it's really strong and uh, try and be in control. Okay. Super, thank you. Yeah, done. Okay, cool. Uh, any more, Alok? Any more questions? Uh, yeah, uh, next is from uh, Amit. Uh, I have unmuted him. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Amit is in beer, man. Wow. How are you doing? I'm good. He's, he's, he's flying, look, man. He's in the air. <laughs> Uh, from the only way we can fly nowadays. Huh? <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, so my question was uh, towards convergence, uh, right? So uh, I've, I've had a lot of hits and misses on conversion. I just get lucky and I get into it. Uh, but I've not really figured out, uh, you know, a consistent way to figure out where the convergence will be. So uh, my question is, how do you figure out convergence one? Um, and what are the key uh, things which you look out for, which work for you consistently to find that? Uh, so that's a, that's a tough one. Uh, I also haven't figured it out, Amit. <laughs> I also haven't figured it out. It's a tough one. Uh, and basically in the mountains, uh, in the mountains I will be, you know, if I'm flying, uh, and you can use even, I, you, I would look at the terrain and see maybe where two air masses join. Uh, otherwise, sometimes it's obviously obvious when you, if maybe if you're flying uh, somewhere that's not far away from the sea, uh, you obviously have the convergence with the sea breeze coming in. And if you have a general meteor wind or big thermic activity, the other way, then you can expect a convergence. Um, another thing to look for would be clouds. Uh, maybe a line of clouds in a place where 
you would obviously maybe not expect a line of clouds. Maybe there isn't a nice ridge underneath, but there is a nice line of clouds. Well, then you can obviously say maybe there is some convergence going on. And by looking by then, okay, you think there might be a convergence there. Then you look at the terrain around uh, or the air masses that you think are moving from around and see how they're coming together there to make the convergence. Um, I, I, like I said, it's not my speciality. I'm not super good at figuring out convergences. Uh, but yeah, things like that, like uh, lines of clouds and then looking at terrain if you're high, uh, lower down, uh, can help. But uh, obviously for me, what's really worked is obviously lines of clouds. When you see lines of clouds, you're like, okay, uh, I think there's something happening there. And then you try and figure out where the wind is coming from, where the convergence is, where you think the best position to place yourself to take advantage of that uh, of that line is yeah that okay. kind of answers some of some of your stuff absolutely they would <laughs> thanks uh, this is helpful uh, i have one more question alok is it okay if i can yeah go ahead yeah so uh, debu um, you know um, i think uh, some of us have started flying the back mountains i uh, probably have been trying to do that for the past three seasons on and off and uh, mm -hmm. one of the questions around back mountains is uh, how do you plan right so uh, let's say you want to go somewhere inside to Thamsar Pass and beyond. Um, and obviously you're going to look at wind direction, uh, the wind strength for the day in the forecast. Then you're going to fly and you're going to try to see uh, what is the wind actually ma mapping with the forecast. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, because the valley wind system is a little more complicated as you go further back. Um, are there any, uh, you know, three or four tips which you have while planning where you want to go behind uh, on, a, on a particular day? Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Well, sure. the first thing I would say is uh, do, the first thing to do is to look at yourself as a pilot and say, are you ready for this? because that is the main problem we're having with the back mountains in beer over the last, I would say it started maybe yeah, like 10 years ago, you know, in the initially only the really good pilots were going, but then once everybody goes, then everyone starts going and we've, we haven't had any serious accidents luckily, but we've had people crashing out and, and all kinds. So the first thing to do would be obviously to say, are you ready? Do you have the skills to cope with, bigger mountains, bigger conditions, valley winds, which is all very different from the front ridge in beer. So I would say that's the first thing. And if you evaluate that and you say, yes, I think I have the skills, I can go, then obviously you're looking at the weather. Uh, and, you know, just you need to realize that once you cross the Barot Valley, you're in uh, much more of a mountain with valley systems, uh, which is very unlike the front ridge in beer where we have the flats in front, yeah? So you need to have a good understanding of how valley winds work and what are the potential dangers of valley wind and where you shouldn't or where you should put yourself. Um, and then obviously you should have good landing out skills uh, to be able to actually, uh, you know, if you do go down landing out and you should be well prepared, I would say with some emergency stuff, you know, medical kit, uh, this and that. Uh, if you do land out back there, as you've seen, you've been there, it, it, it could be a day or two to walk out. So considering all of those things, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't recommend a lot of people usually to go, you know, people ask me, should I go on the back? And uh, if they're good pilots, fine. But uh, I tend to be more on the on the safety side with the back mountain. So uh, does that answer some some of the things? I mean, I know you were asking more on uh, on, you know, wind and technicalities basically for me uh if the day is you know if i get up in beer you go up to hanuman peak you climb up if you're getting high enough let's say which is minimum three two three four to actually do the jump into the back then you look at the conditions in the back if it's looking at all hairy or if it's looking at all dodgy then i probably won't go unless it's looking like a perfect day and you can see obviously if there's clouds building in the back you can see if there is a lot of east wind uh, which is usually sometimes the problem we have in the back is the east wind is strong uh, if you can see there's a lot of east wind you can obviously feel it on the front ridge then uh, i would save it for another day uh, if it's looking like a good day then obviously i would go 
Um, another piece of advice, if you're going in the back, uh, try and avoid doing it alone. Obviously, try and go with at least one or two friends. So you're, uh, you know, you're a small group. Uh, you can help each other out. And if something goes wrong, someone knows where something happened or whatever. Does that Thanks. answer a bit? Uh, yeah, it, it does help. Uh, you know, at least in respect to the prerequisites of uh, when you want to start your journey towards uh, back mountain flying. And that's, that's yeah. it. Thank you. Okay. okay. We, have, we have next question from Preeti. Hi, Revo. So my question is coming back Hi, to Preet. KK's, sorry, KK's question. So, you know, when you start flying and I yeah. want to improve as an XC pilot, I won't call myself XC pilot. But uh, if you want to improve, so do you rec recommend uh, SIV and how many times, like before you really get comfortable with your wings? Because I will never be an acro pilot. I would stick to a little bit of cross country and improve my skills there. So what do you recommend um, SIV uh, and what, which maneuvers do you have to do uh, the whole thing? Uh, no, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would recommend SIV to to most pilots, uh, whatever your level, and especially, uh, especially if you feel that maybe you are not super comfortable, or you need to work on some stuff, or you you want to get more comfortable in the air and not be afraid of turbulence, okay? Because that's what a lot of people are afraid of. As soon as it starts moving around a little bit, it gets a little bit too much. You know. So uh, I would recommend SIV to everyone. I don't think it's, it's, you have to do it multiple times, but I would say at least uh, once. I mean, uh, when I teach SIV, I, um, uh, I have a basic program, but uh, you know, after I see a pilot fly once, I do the first flight, uh, which is very simple. Uh, I adapt that program to the pilot because, uh, I mean, the idea to do a SIV course is to improve your confidence and your skill and your knowledge about how to react when things go wrong. Uh, and to do the opposite, which, which would be to make you do maneuvers which will scare you more and send you away from a course more scared than when you arrived at the course would be completely beside the point. Yeah. yeah. So I actually yeah. adapt uh, my SIVs uh, according to the pilot. And I have done SIVs where I've had a pilot who I felt was not ready for anything. And all he did was for the whole course was just pitching and very small collapses and very basic things just to give him the confidence to see that that's OK. So, yes, I would recommend the SIV. Uh, and uh, you don't have to do all the maneuvers and depends on your instructor. If your instructor is a good instructor and he feels you are ready for the next maneuver, he will move you along. And if he feels that you need to work on those things, then he will concentrate on those things. All right. So uh, yeah, I would recommend the SIV course. All right, thank you. Okay. Back to us. Look. Any I... more questions, guys? Gokul here, can I? Can I... Go ahead, Gokul, yeah, go ahead. Uh, hi, Debu. Hi, Gokul. <laughs> I can't see you, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, stay. Uh... Can Have you got go a beard? Gokul, uh, switch on your video, Gokul. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, no. <laughs> no beard. Uh, my, I want your thoughts on... 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 I want your yeah, Debo, I want your specific thoughts on ideal usage of speed bar. Uh, for example, we are transitioning on full speed bar or 75% speed bar, and to the next point, we reach a thermal point and hit the thermal. And how do you go about adjusting the speed bar and ideally using it um, for a good? Okay, good, good, good question, Gokul. Uh, so uh, let's start with just talking about maybe for for the more probably what uh, what the speed bar does. As you know, the speed bar basically we have the speed bar. It uh, increases our speed, uh, and it also increases our sink rate slightly. It also increases the angle of attack of the paraglider. Okay, so making the the angle of attack uh, lower 
is obviously going to bring the glider closer to the collapse point. So we have a danger, which can be that the glider will collapse more easily on speed bar. Also, when we are on speed bar, we are not going to be using the brakes, obviously, because uh, that, you know, that would be beside the point. So we don't have the feeling or the transmission that's going on through the brakes. Uh, so it's more easy to get a, a, get a collapse. So everyone should be aware of that when they're using the speed bar. Uh, now to answer your question, um, when you're doing a transition, how much speed bar should I use? Basically, which is, I think, your question, yeah, Gokul? Pretty much? Yeah, combination of both. One is the transition, uh, at the time of the transition. Second is, suppose you are in the, you are hit the thermal. At that point of time, how do you go about ideally using the, the speed bar? Uh, one minute, what's going on with my thing? No. Something happened to my screen. Anyway, uh, no problem. Um, hello, I don't know. Ah, it's back. Okay. Back. Yes. Um, Something with Zoom, so, I guess. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, uh, okay, Gokul, to answer your question, when uh, when you're doing a transition, how much speed bar should I be using? Uh, there is a theory called McCready theory. It's quite complicated, uh, but to put it very simply. Uh, it really depends on the day and at the height you're leaving for the transition, okay? Uh, and how comfortable you are with flying your wing and how turbulent the conditions are, etc. If you are super high and you want to get as fast as possible to the next thermal, which is obvious and it's easy, obviously you're going to push full bar, yeah? If, uh, uh, almost. <laughs> if, uh, if uh, you are not so high and it's looking a little tight to get to your next thermal, then obviously you're going to use less bar and you want to maximize your glide. I mean, a lot of modern gliders uh, actually glide best at a quarter to one third bar. So you're obviously always going to be using a bit of bar. But uh, yeah, it really depends on, on the situation, uh, how, much, uh, how much speed bar you're going to use. Um, so have a look. There's some videos on internet about MacReady and uh, different points of view. Uh, MacReady basically is a speed to fly theory, which uh, tells you how fast you should be flying. And on a paraglider, since we are a very slow uh, flying uh, machine, uh, as soon as conditions are a little bit strong and we know that there's thermals ahead, basically it tells us to fly full speed all the time. But obviously, that's not going to work for everyone because flying at full speed can be a little bit scary. So, um, so yeah, depends on the situation and depends if you're looking, you know, if you need your max glide or you need your max speed or you're trying to arrive as high as possible. So you need to adapt all of those things uh, to see how much speed bar you're going to use. That makes sense, Gokul? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah? TK. Uh, next, uh, Clint, we'll go ahead. Yep. Hey, hi, Devo. Hi, Clint. So my question is, what are the parameters that you look into on selecting a good XC day in terms of weather and other stuff? Uh, so well, in terms of weather, obviously, you're going to look, uh, where you look at the forecast and you see, uh, basically, I, I, I don't, you know, especially in beer and stuff, I don't go too, too much on the forecast. Um, basically, you want to check out uh, in beer, especially in beer in spring, the overdevelopment for the day and the tendencies to overdevelop. Uh, if you see that, uh, that that's not too high, it's obviously going to be a good day. You're going to check out the, the wind speeds or the general meteor wind. I mean, that's especially uh, valid for us for here in the Alps where I am now. Not that we can fly at the moment, but uh, uh, in beer, uh, we don't get affected so much by meteor winds. Uh, whereas here, as soon as you know you have a north wind or a south wind uh, that's over a certain speed, and the forecasts are, are quite precise here, if, as soon as you have strong wind that's over a certain speed, you know that the day is going to be blown out. It might be a really good thermic day, uh, but uh, yeah, you know that uh, it's going to be, be blown out. Uh, also, you're looking at the time of year, obviously, uh, you know, the length of the days, depending on, uh, on, on what, what you want to do. I mean, obviously, spring and summer, you're going to have longer days than uh, autumn 
or especially winter. So those, those are some of the things. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, that's it kind of. I mean, checking the basic weather forecast. I'm not, not very... I'm not very good at going deep into the weather. Uh, Gurpreet is much better at that, uh, at forecasting. So I just look at the general thing and I go on feeling as well. You know, if it feels like it's going to be a good day, you give it a try and see how it goes. Okay. So how did you select your record day? Ah, <laughs> that's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, basically uh, I got lucky. Uh, I got well. I got lucky a few times. Uh, just look at a, at a, at the weather and the general pattern, and you know that there's you know there's obviously three or four good days, and just try and uh, pick uh, just try and pick those three or four good days to be in place and to be on form, and uh, and I usually got lucky. I mean, usually I only go for three or four days, and I usually manage to to hit the days. Uh, so yeah, just. Just looking at a, at a session of three or four days and being ready, ready for it and trying every day. And obviously, if it's not the day, I will cut the day short to save energy for, for the next day to try. Yeah? Yep. Okay, cool. Thanks, Devu. So, okay. Devu, we have time. Uh, do you have time? We have two more questions. Okay. Okay. We're on. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are on. Yes. Okay, Nikhil, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, Devu. This is Nikhil. Hi. Hi, Nikhil. My question, my question is about uh, what would be some of your strategies to exit a strong thermal safely? For example, you're, you're riding a five meters per second thermal being thrown inside your harness left to right, and then now you're reaching the cloud base, and then you see, you see the puff, and now you know it's time to exit. So what, what steps do you do to exit a thermal safely? Do you go towards windward side, or do you, do you pull on brakes, get off? The bar. I mean, some of the things. Can you share your strategies? Uh, yeah, sure. That's a good question. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you want to try and come out on the upwind side, because if you come out on the downwind side, if it's a very strong thermal, obviously, if there is any wind, uh, this is if there is a fair amount of wind. If there is not much wind, then it's not as important. If you come out on the downwind side, uh, you're gonna. Uh, well, first of all, you're going to be coming out of the, the weaker lift, which is on the downwind side. And then if the thermal is very strong, it's obviously going to block the wind, which is going to create more turbulence. And obviously, any strong thermal, uh, you know, if you can imagine a column of strong air going up, obviously on the edges where it's coming down, uh, you're going to have strong turbulence. So uh, you, you basically, uh, the strategy is to just... Uh, hold on tight <laughs> and go the way, you know, go out and, you know, be a bit on the brakes and be prepared to actively fly your glider and be prepared for some big sink. Uh, obviously, you know, if it's a very strong thermal going up, you're going to have big sink on the outside. So I would try and exit upwind if that's possible. But, you know, that's like I said, if there is a strong wind, if there isn't much wind, I will exit in the direction I want to transit. Uh, be on the brakes and be ready to do some serious inputs, uh, active flying. You know, if a glider dives forward, you might have to brake all the way down, but be ready to come up again quickly, or it might be to one side. And then as soon as you've exited the turbulence, you're going to hit the sink. Uh, and in the sink, if you are comfortable, I mean, usually I will get straight on the bar and push at least half bar to get myself quickly through that sink. Um, and away from the thermal. So uh, yeah, basically, again, uh, like we talked about before, be ready to be aggressive, uh, and don't you know you know keep that glider under control because obviously there's going to be some turbulence coming out. And mentally, also, you can prepare yourself for it. You know, some deep breaths. Okay, here we go. Let's get ready. Go. <laughs> that also helps. You know, if you mentally prepare yourself for action. Got it. Thank you. Does that answer? Okay. Any more, Alok? Um, I think we have one more question from Shunit. Fly Nirvana would be Shunit. Yeah. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Debu. So actually, I have two questions. So one is hi. about. Hi, Shunit. Yeah. Hi, Debu. So what hi, I want to ask is. Um, 
how do you choose a good line and another one is um how do you outclimb people in like a big gaggle uh what do you mean by outline outclimb i'm saying like there's a bunch of people above you ah. like how do you try to get above okay. them okay sorry sorry yeah i so i thought you meant outline not outclimb okay yeah <laughs> um how would you choose it well the, it depends if there's especially if there's a gaggle of people uh and they're above you uh or if there's some with you basically it comes down to observation uh so obviously you're looking for signs of where the strongest part of that thermal or the lift is uh or if you can figure out maybe what people could be doing better uh then you can try and get yourself in that stronger part of the lift um again when there's a Are you are you talking more about comp flying sunit or just general flying yeah comp flying okay so trying to figure out if if you can outline them first of all yeah. in a comp because you know you might arrive lower at a thermal and uh, they're all really good pilots and they're all higher and you might come you know they've obviously had a good cycle in a in a thermal and you might be at the end of the cycle so there might not be the option to outline them so at that point you want to maybe be as efficient as possible and get yourself to the next climb in good time with the cycle to obviously maybe try and join up and outclimb that group uh if you arrive at a group and you're not much uh, lower and you feel that you can outclimb them obviously you're going to look for the core uh by observing others or by observing if there's anyone below you or above you what's going on and uh, then uh if you have really good thermaling skills uh you can you know usually you can uh climb through a group if uh, if it's a big group and people are you know trying to stay out of each other's way you uh, you don't want to get too aggressive but uh, it is possible to you know if you have superior thermaling skills it depends on the competition and on the gaggle on the gaggle you're flying and what was your first question sunit i i missed yeah that. i was saying that. how do you choose a good line again is this competition related or uh, Both. general both yeah uh how do you choose a good line okay choosing a line uh while flying cross country is a kind of doesn't really have answers very hard to explain i mean it kind of comes with intuition and and feeling sometimes obviously if you have a gaggle of pilots in front of you this makes life much easier uh you can observe you know the different lines people are taking and uh make a conclusion as to what you think is the best line or you could even split the lines you could see maybe people further forward is better there so you could do a line that's taking you on one person's line and then joining another person's line uh obviously when you're flying alone or without a gaggle in front of you uh you need to make that call and uh i often look at the terrain or where i think uh or or uh how much wind there is and what line i should take to arrive at my next trigger and how the wind is going to affect that and how if i fly slightly this way or that way uh what you know what is the wind going to do to that or what is the terrain below if it's releasing any small stuff where can i maximize my line to to take advantage of that yeah so answer your question sunit yeah it does thanks devo theek hai um i think there's something that gurpreet wants to suggest gurpreet go ahead no further questions we have right now in line uh hi devo um, hi ji just wanted to suggest that uh, a few months back uh, almost a year back actually but we did a interview with uh, me and uh, vijay about uh, strategy in flying uh, probably about leading yeah. and following so i was suggesting that maybe in the next session you do uh, could you share your ideas about strategies how you decide and uh, about the like about following leading what to do when you're in lead stuff like that yeah uh yeah 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 uh, we can do that i mean i haven't done many comps in the last year so i'm uh, i'm kind of out of date and i was and i don't think i'll be doing many this year so <laughs> but i can give it a try sure not <laughs> <laughs> no 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 you definitely not out of the uh, equal way of doing it and uh, we noticed it even with people 
first we heard this today. So I'm very curious to hear your views on this. Really yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Next, uh, next session we can, uh, we can, we can talk more about that. It, it could be interesting for sure. All right, cool. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Gurpreet. Okay. Uh, we have one more question, Debu. You can take it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm on. Okay. I can change uh, my, my busy schedule. Can wait. You know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Thank you, Debu. Go ahead, Bhushan. You, ha you have a question, right? Go ahead. Uh, hey, Debu. Um, so I am more interested in knowing about uh, how you progress from being a leisure flyer who flew uh, many, many days uh, in a year and actually uh, setting your own goals and growing into an XC pilot. I'm more interested in uh, that uh, aspect of it and ultimately becoming um, a XC guide, XC master uh, who applies record distances. Like how did that transition happen? Because uh, I also uh, see in your folio that you uh, were representing uh, India in aerobatics and a uh, lot of uh, other aspects also in your flying. So how, how did uh, the transition from leisure flying uh, to all these different uh, aspects uh, happen? Like what were your uh, motivational uh, aspects and uh, what were the key milestones that you identified in this journey? Thank you. Um, basically, I was, I, was, I was lucky enough to, to get into this sport uh, very early uh, at a young age. Uh, thanks to Mr. Roshandal, we can see in the corner there. <laughs> uh, and uh, our progression was slow because it was the beginning of the sport but uh, you know there was a bunch of us uh, with Ajay and uh, you know Gurpreet and all the old uh, the old gang uh, the motivation was high even if the progression was slow and uh, it, it gave us a way of life uh, which uh, which I continued to follow and Basically, uh, the first few years we were leisure flyers, but then we got, you know, we all got quick, quite uh, early on into doing tandems, which uh, which was a good way um, to to make a living. And uh, by doing, uh, you know, doing tandems and flying slowly more and more cross country and uh, exploring. Uh, for me, a big um, one of the big milestones was. Uh, you know, I uh, with my flying, I'd reached a point. I think it was about 2002. I'd been flying for maybe seven or eight years, uh, and that's when in beer we had the first um, pre World Cup, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of uh, the world's top pilots turned up, and we had a great competition. And for me, that really opened up. Uh, that really opened up my eyes as to what is actually possible and uh, you know there's a whole world out there uh, and after that I was lucky enough to be able to uh, to come to Europe to, to you know to see uh, the whole the whole of the paragliding scene here and uh, to participate in competition and uh, from there you know doing the first few competitions and learning more and more from there it actually opened up a whole load of a uh, lot of doors to you know to start teaching and guiding people and uh, and then I started doing more and more acrobatics which uh, which helped as well and just meeting a lot of people and and getting into the paragliding world and it all kind of slowly slowly came together from there does that answer your question Bushan uh, yes yes it does thank you for sharing yeah okay Hello. Okay, guys, any more uh, questions? I don't see any other questions, but you can go ahead if someone has. Okay, Badri has a question. Badri, video me aadu par kar raha hai, sir. Yeah, more easy. <laughs> more easy. Okay, uh, Debu, uh, thank you so much. It's uh, really going well. Uh, but whereas, you know, I think we have covered uh, more of a uh, advanced part. Can you a little cover for the most basics, you know, right from like the people who are visiting the mountains, like where first time, like the first couple of seasons, and uh, they really get surprised by the, the taking that first thermal. So if you can give them uh, the most optimized way to improve themselves in terms of spending more time in thermal within, without getting scared, like morning, evenings, 
and as well as slowly improving themselves to going to the distances and developing the endurance as well thank you um debu um, if okay, you debu just yeah. a quick thing if you want to break you can have a have some water i have seen you haven't had any water since past one hour. Huh? Uh, let's let's finish this question and then I think it's time anyway. No. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, Badri. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, basically, yeah, like you say, uh, for especially for maybe pilots from the south and stuff who are not used to flying in uh, somewhere like Beer, uh, it can be quite intimidating and conditions can be quite strong and it's it's quite different from flying, let's say, in Kamshed or whatever, where it can get strong, but it's. It's more wind and a uh, different kind of flying. Um, what I would say is, uh, if you're, you know, if you're a new pilot and you're coming to beer, uh, don't get caught up in the group pressure of, oh, I flew to Palampur and back, or you have to fly to Dharamsala and back till you don't do that. You're, you know, not part of the club or whatever. Uh, I mean, you know, we all fly to enjoy. That's the first thing you need to do is, is to enjoy yourself. So if you're not enjoying it and pushing it, then that's beside the point. Um, so I would say the important thing is um, to to take it easy and 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 to go slow. Yeah. So in the beginning, I would say it's not even important to go anywhere. You can just, you know, and Billing is such a good place to learn cross country with these flats we have in front. Uh, like when I have people who are really low level and I'm teaching them uh, in beer, one thing I get them to do is to go into the house thermal to climb up to go west to plus one, as we call it, the first ridge west, okay? Take the climb there and then just work up the ridge uh, till you're high enough to take a climb to come back to Billing. And I just make them do that box for the whole day and which gets people comfortable just thermaling around in different, you know, in different kind of uh, air from what they're used to and, and actually doing transitions. And once people get comfortable doing that, then you can move one ridge at a time and come back move you know you can go maybe to the red temple and back so that's the nice thing about beer is that you know you can actually take it really slow and i would say the important thing is uh yeah not to get caught up in the peer pressure and uh, just to take it really slow and 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 push each ridge one at a time until you're comfortable with also what what helps uh what is great with teaching cross country in beer is I know some people say, you know, it's repetitive. Okay, we're always doing the same route up and down. Uh, but each time you do that route, uh, you know, for the next time, you know, okay, last time I made that mistake or I shouldn't go there, it's a scary place. So the next time you'll avoid it and, you know, you'll get through that place faster. So I think repetition, you know, is, is a way of learning uh, and you can use all those lessons from each time you've repeated that route to eventually be comfortable in, in, in flying the route. And you know, the more you do it, you more you'll get comfortable with flying in that kind of air. Does that Thank make you. sense, Badri? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Debu, we have more questions coming in. I seriously recommend you drink water or you can close the session as well if you're really tired. <laughs> what time is it? Uh, Einstein. Let me have a drink of water. And, yeah, yeah, uh, cool. I can do one or two more. Then I think we yeah. stop. Huh? <laughs> yeah, cool. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's recording again. Yeah, go ahead. Rakesh, go ahead. It's your turn. Hi, Rakesh. Hi, Debu. Hi. Uh, so, uh, my question is, uh, can you uh, uh, help with some technique or method uh, for piercing through an inversion? Possible. Okay, for piercing uh, inversion. Possible on that. Uh, okay, uh, good question, Rakesh. Um, uh, piercing inversion, I mean, in beer, we have uh, like, uh, you know, we obviously have a, a lot of inversion. Um, the, it really depends if, uh, if it's in the mountains. If you have mountains going through the inversion, uh, it would make it much easier. Uh, basically, for me, the way to pierce an inversion, uh, if there is mountains, would be that you will use the mountains as step 
as a step to get yourself as close to the top of, you know, the bottom of the inversion of the top or whatever you want to call it, uh, with the terrain as close to it as possible. Obviously, when the thermal is starting from the terrain, it's going to be stronger, which might have enough strength to push through the, through the inversion. So say, you know, if you have a slope like this and the inversion is here, okay, uh, obviously the thermal that's starting lower down, by the time it gets to the inversion, it's not going to have the strength to pierce it. Whereas the thermal that starts here is going to have the strength to pierce through the inversion and you want to be at that point. So using the mountain, you know, or the slope as a step to get yourself closer to the, to the inversion layer uh, to actually get enough, a thermal strong enough to push you through and obviously being ready for the turbulence as that hits the top of the inversion. Uh, that, that would be one way. Uh, if it's flat lands or it's flat, it's much harder. Uh, then it's a story of patience or maybe looking in different areas where there might be a stronger climb and trying to find the strongest climb you can to try and get you through. Does that answer your question, Rakesh? Sure, cool. Thank, thank you. I have one more question if, if, you, if I can ask. Rakesh, I have a question in the notebook. Mein. <laughs> uh, my question is what is the secret of the early birds there are always some uh, few handful early birds where the rest of the pilots are still trying to figure what the day is going to be like and they're already you know uh, they already uh, have taken off and they're already tumbling and uh, What's the secret? Is just just uh, meteor uh, research, or or uh, is the forecast, or or and practice, or is it is it uh, something beyond that? Uh, no, basically, I think it's uh, it's a bit of both. Maybe you know you feel it's going to be a good day. I mean, I mean, I know me personally. If I'm going flying for myself, and uh, if if I have a goal, whatever it can be. Um, you know, especially if it's a distance goal, uh, I want to be in the air as soon as it's working to make the most of the day, obviously. Uh, also, uh, to figure out, you know, the day, if, uh, if it's going to be a shit day, then, uh, then I'll go down and do something else. Uh, but, uh, I don't think there's a big secret to it, Rakesh. I think it's just, uh, you know, if, as soon as you feel that you are able to stay up or make headway, uh, then and you're keen and you have a plan, then uh, just get out there, you know, and see how the day goes. Obviously, if the day is not going to be great or it's whatever, you can always go down. But uh, for me, yeah, there's no big secret to it. It's just taking off early. <laughs> Good. Thanks. Thanks. On the chat, we have a question from uh, Alan first. That in a weak thermal, where should you look for a better one, upwind or downwind? Uh, depends what you have upwind and what you have downwind. <laughs> uh, obviously, if you have the choice. <laughs> uh, if you don't have the choice and it's windy, like when you're flying in Panchagani or Gamsha or wherever, uh, flying upwind is obviously going to be much harder unless you're super high uh, and you have a super... Uh, indication of a big thermal up ahead so obviously then you want to fly downwind because you know you're going to get much further much faster and have a much bigger area to explore uh, with potential thermal activity yeah uh, whereas in the mountains it could be different it really depends what you have upwind or downwind on your height there's a lot of factors that come into into that decision uh, there isn't just a, a clear black and white up or upwind or downwind does that make any sense? Hello. What, hello. Are the, what are the other factors that you're saying that a lot of factors go into it? Some of those factors, please. Uh, some of those factors, well, obviously, uh, do you have, you know, is there obvious thermal trigger upwind or downwind, you know, and how far away is it? Uh, if I'm flying upwind, can I easily get to it? Uh, if I'm flying downwind, can I get to it? Uh, are, are there any obstacles uh, between me and the next trigger or the next thermal source that I'm looking at? 
uh, which is going to be, you know, which is going to be the safer option. Obviously, I'm going to take the safer option. Uh, factors like that, Alan. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, those are the general ones. What I wanted to know was, uh, upwind gives you better thermals, or downwind gives you better thermals? Apart from the orographic factors, the trigger factors, apart from all those, the general ones. Normally, in well, beer, uh, in beer, in beer, we don't really have have much much wind so in beer you know rather than flying upwind or downwind you're actually following the ridge lines or you know going from one valley to the next and going for the um, for the the trigger points so it doesn't you know upwind or downwind doesn't really upwind or downwind looking for a thermal comes more into play when you're flying in flatlands and stuff flatlands. i would say thank you yeah Okay, I think uh, we'll take one last question. Our is back. Yeah, we'll take one last question. Okay, cancel, I'm done. I'm done then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have one last question. I from just KK. figured out that I can go through the other pages. <laughs> so okay. one last question from KK is, at what height would you connect a lee side thermal relative to the ridge line? Uh... Obviously, I would try and connect it at the ridge line if I can, and uh, because uh, then I might not be too much in the lee, and I can make the most of the thermal anyway, and I can keep myself kind of out of the lee. Uh, and if not, then I would try and go in uh, not too close to the ridge. I would try and actually go in lower onto the. the the source of the lee side climb so that I'm actually okay I think we lost you Debu so I wanna maybe go lower Debu the connectivity from your side was a little bad Hello? Yeah. Uh, can, can you repeat your answer again from the point where you said you would go to the source of the lee side? That's where we lost you. Uh, okay. Um, I would, uh, yeah, I, like I was saying, either I, if I can get the climb at the ridge level, uh, then I would try and do it there. But if I am obviously not going to come in to the ridge level, uh, then I would try and figure out where the source is and I would actually take the climb from slightly lower down to be in the core to get through the turbulence rather than going very close into the ridge line on the lee side, which is where the worst turbulence is going to be. If you see what I mean, lower down, uh, there's going to be the anabatic flow uh, and the thermal, uh, which is probably going to be less turbulent than when it gets near the top of the ridge where it's being hit by the lee side of the wind. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks. Okay. Okay. I think with that, we will uh, stop the Q&A uh, for today. Yeah. Uh, I think let's, let's, <laughs> thank yeah, you. I'm almost Thanks, yeah, Debo. My is on my case. He wants me to come. <laughs> you can Put come. You want to come? Camera. You want to come and say hi? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want to come in? Ah, that, that got rid of him. You put him in front of the <laughs> camera. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, cool. Debu. Yeah. And uh, it was a great session. Cool. That was, um, uh, that was uh, fun. I hope. Uh... Yes, yeah. Debu. Thank yeah. you very much. Hello. Lots of questions. Hello, Padri. Thanks a lot. I hope we can do that soon again. That's what Debu is You're welcome. <laughs> Debu, let, let Debu have his <laughs> break. So uh, for everyone, yeah, Debu I started. I need a day to recover from that. Yeah. Good. All right. Um, on behalf of everyone, Debu, I would like to thank you. And uh, please, for everyone yeah. who has not watched Debu's videos, you should go back and watch Debu's videos. He has uh, captured spectacular views and he has an amazing taste in the music as well. Debu, you, if you want to share where people can find you online, that would also be good because then people can follow you there.